morning we're going to talk about today. In, in, in the book of Exodus, we open up and find the children of Israel are stuck in Egypt as slaves. They're not there on vacation, visiting, seeing the pyramids and the Sphinx. They are enslaved with cruel taskmasters of the Egyptians. And God sends Moses to deliver his people. He raises them up. We talked about this in December, about how Moses was not everybody, anybody's first choice to go. Remember, he didn't know how to talk to them. And there he goes to send them out. But he was able to do it because God was with him. And God showed off spectacularly. And in fact, this was Yahweh's coming out party for the nations. He came and brought down Egypt, the most powerful nation of its day, through some of the smallest things of his creation. Gnats and flies and frogs and blood and darkness and pestilence and hail and things like that. And Egypt was destroyed. And the last of these ten plagues was the Passover plague, where the angel of death came and all the firstborn who did not have the blood over their doorway were killed. And so off Israel goes, now free, with all the wealth of Egypt. It's amazing. Read it on your own. You can read it, Exodus chapter 1 through 13. Uh, don't do it right now. But read that. And, and we get to chapter 14, and they, they've left now. They're no longer slaves. And they come and they stand before the Red Sea. And the Red Sea is the natural border from Egypt to the rest of the Sinai Peninsula. And they're stuck there at the ocean, the sea, and they don't know what to do. And in fact, they're like, wait, hold on a second. What, what, why are we going this way? We're stuck in a sea. You can't walk through a sea, right? You can't walk on water. You can't. They don't have scuba gear. And so they don't know what to do. So you know what happened? God parted the Red Sea. Now, some people, you watch the History Channel and all that stuff, they're like, you know, it wasn't really the Red Sea, it was some little puddle or that, 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 that. I'm sorry. Parting any kind of body of water is pretty cool to me, all right? I believe it was the Red Sea because the Bible tells me it's the Red Sea, so I'm going to stick with that. And so here we are, the Red Sea, they've just been delivered, and verse 21, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept back the sea by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into what? Dry land. So the waters were divided. The sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on dry land, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians took up pursuit. So Pharaoh realizes that all of his laborers have left. And so he gets up, he's like, no, 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 I changed my mind again. He gets the whole army out to chase Israel, and they're, they're on their heels. Now the Red Sea has parted. There's a wall of water on the left and a wall of water on the right, and these people are walking through on what kind of land? Dry land, not muddy puddles, but dry land, walking through the sea, water on either side. That's amazing. And then the years come to Egypt, and they start... They start coming, the horses, the chariots, they're all really angry, right? They're in hot pursuit. In verse 24, in the morning, watch, the Lord looked down on the army of the Egyptians, threw the pillar of fire and fire, and brought the army of the Egyptians into confusion. Now, this is an important verse for us, verse 25. He caused their chariot wheels to swerve, and he made them drive with difficulty. So the Rhode Islanders said, wait, hold on. I could just relate to that verse, living in Appenock Circle here. Bless your heart. He caused their chariot wheels to swerve, and he made them drive with difficulty. So the Egyptians said, let us flee from Israel, for the Lord is fighting for them against the Egyptians. And then the Lord said to them, stretch out your hands over the sea, so that the waters may come back over the Egyptians, over the chariot and their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak, while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horses, even Pharaoh's entire army that had gone into the sea after them. Not even one of them remained. But the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea, and the waters were like a wall to them on the right to the left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, 
The people fear the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and the servant of God. So not only are they no longer enslaved, but their enemy is no more. They don't have to fear being found. They don't have to fear uh, a second attack. The Egyptian army is no more. Israel is on the other side, the other side of the Red Sea, free and saved. Because God delivered fully. He didn't just release them from bondage. He got rid of their enemy and brought them to a new place where they would be saved. This is about 400, over 400 years for the nation of Israel was saved. And now they're free, never to go back again. to slavery. Isn't that amazing? What would you do with, with a great moment of celebration, uh, a great day of deliverance? Don't you think it, it'd be the kind of thing that you'd want to celebrate and rejoice? It would. Man, you ever, like, almost get into a car accident, but you didn't because I put my brakes on while you were coming into Avalon Circle and let you go? Right? And I didn't get into an action. You didn't get into action. What do you do? You go, whoo! It's like the blood rushed up, you got the adrenaline pumped, and then you're like, whoo, it's all right. Some of you know that feeling more than others as the culprit. But. So then you, you, you rejoice and you realize what you've been delivered from. And so that's exactly what Israel did. Chapter 15 of Exodus records uh, a full length psalm of praise written by Moses. The Lord, uh, verse 15, chapter 1, uh, sorry, chapter 15, verse 1, the Lord. How about then Moses and the sons of Israel sang the song to the Lord and said, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and his rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God. I will praise him. My Father's God, I will extol him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army. He cast down to the sea. And the choices of the officers, he drowned in the Red Sea. The depth, the deeps covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. I mean, Moses is just breaking out into this song of praise for his deliverance. Free. And in your great, the greatness of your excellence, you overthrow those who rise up against you. You send forth your burning anger, and it consumes them as chaff. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters were piled up. Flowing waters stood up like a heap. The deep were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be gratified against them. I will draw out my sword. My hand will destroy them. How'd that work out? You, God, blew with your wind, and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? You stretched out your hand, and the earth swallowed them. In your loving kindness, you have led the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you have guided them to your holy habitation. Isn't that beautiful? It's like, God, you saved me because you loved me. Not because of anything I did. Praise be to you. Who's like you? Who's like you, God? Who's like you, Yahweh? Nobody compares to you. You know, my enemies were pretty strong. They were pretty tough. They plotted. They planned. They had a good strategy. They had more strength than I did. And here they went. They pursued me. They pursued me. And Lord, you just went. And the sea fell on them. I didn't have to fight. I didn't have to work up the strength and make a strategy. For you fought for me. You delivered me. And you did it all to bring me to your holy habitation. You delivered me so that I could be brought to you. I could be free to serve you. It's what he's saying here. Can we relate to this? Amen? Verse 18 is a good verse you can remember and memorize on the spot. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Say that with me. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. You, you know a Bible. There you go. The Lord shall reign forever and ever, for the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, and the Lord brought back the waters of the sea on them. But the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea. And then Millie, the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took the tambourine in her hand. What's that saying? Does that say Millie? Oh, Miriam. 
took the tambourine and the women went out with their timbrels and dancing. Can I get a tambourine for a second here? We got like five tambourines. Can I? There we go. All right. You don't play the tambourine at a funeral. You play the tambourine when you're celebrating something, right? And so they got the tambourines out and they sang the song with joy. And the lady then sang, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and his rider he's hurled into the sea. Let's have the ladies say that together. Verse 21. And Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord. It probably sounded better than that. And then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness. Amazing. Free from their uh, enemies, free from slavery, free from bondage. What do they do? They praise God. They have a praise service. They have a praise service. And then they journey for three days into the wilderness, which is towards the promised land. Now, earlier in Exodus, Tom, if you put up this verse, earlier in Exodus chapter 5, when Moses went to Pharaoh, he said, Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may celebrate a feast to me, where? In the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is, who is Yahweh? Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. And besides, I will not let Israel go. This is before any of the plagues happened. And then they said, the God of Hebrews, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go on a what? A three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Otherwise, he will fall upon us with pestilence over the sword. So Moses' is opening line when he goes to Pharaoh is, let God's people go that they may serve me. Let us journey three days into the wilderness so we may sacrifice and worship him. That was the original plan. And now, they've gone through the Red Sea. They've celebrated His goodness on the other side with rejoicing and with praise. And now, they take the three-day journey, and it's time to worship Him. Three days. Here we are. And then, verse 23, when they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, it was named Mara. So the people grumbled. They grumbled at Moses, saying, What shall we drink? No, what are we drinking? What's going on here? Now, there was no good water for them. That's a problem. But it didn't mean they had to grumble. It didn't mean they had to grumble. Sometimes my kids. Sometimes my kids, we sit down at the table, set, we got food, everything's ready. And, you know, Jess has made beautiful dinner, and the kids are all set, they got it cut in the ways they like it, everybody's happy, everybody's got the right color plate, and the right color utensil to match it, and all the rest. Finally, I can come and sit down, and sit down, and I'm ready. And then go, Yeah, I don't have a drink! I don't have a drink! I'm like, All right, uh, let me go get you a drink. Go into the other room, make sure I got the white colored cup because the white drink is milk for one, water for one, juice for another, but not too much juice, gotta be water in order for the same thing. Sometimes they just complain about stuff. And you know what I said to my kids the other day? I said, There has never been a day in your life when you have not had what you need. I teach you a drink every single day. We've got limitless amounts of water in the house, right? We are so blessed. Stop your complaining, Josiah, you two year old little whining. <laughs> Now, my kids come to me and say, hey, Dad, I'm thirsty. Can I please have some water? You know what I'm going to say? Oh, I forgot to get you water. My fault. I'll go get it. i bring it in. But when they go, ah, oh, we're going to have water. I'm like, oh, boy. Hold me back, Jeff. Hold me back. No. That's what we have here. They didn't have water, but they didn't need to grumble. But they did. This is three days after the Red Sea stood on end. Why? Because their enemy was pursuing, because they used to be slaves in Egypt. Three days later, on Sunday, they had a praise service, but on Wednesday, they're grumbling. On Sunday, they remember the goodness of, of God, but by Wednesday, they go, Thank God we're not like that, right? 
And then they cried out to the Lord. The Lord showed them a tree and threw it into the water, and the waters became clean. Made for them statutes and regulations and tested them. And he said, If you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His sight, and give ear to His commandments and keep all His statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have been put on the Egyptians, for I, the Lord, am your healer. And when they came to Elam, there were twelve springs of water and seventy big palms. They camped there beside the water. You know, this all happened on the fourteenth day of the first month. They got free from Egypt on the fourteenth day of the first month. Today's the fifteenth day of our first month. And three days later, they were grumbling. They had their worship and the praise on Sunday. But what Wednesday going to be like? Well, maybe they got their attitude right. I'm sure they did. You know, sometimes a good talking to is all you need to get your head on straight, right? Well, look what happens in chapter 15. Then they set out for Elam, and the congregation of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness of Sinai, which was between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month. So now it's February 15th, essentially. One month later. And then the whole congregation of the sons of Israel did what? Grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Isn't that just like people? This is, this is such a uh, relatable story for us. Because although we laugh at Israel's foolishness, this is what we do. This is so what we do. They have deliverance and praise on Sunday, but by Wednesday, they're grumbling. They make a, a new resolution at the beginning of the year to stay faithful to the Lord, but by the time February comes, they're grumbling again. Anybody ever, can anybody relate to that? Ooh. That is why, with a lesson like this and countless other records in Scripture, it is so important for you and I to not base our faith for today on what God has done yesterday, nor base our lives today on what's going to happen tomorrow. We have to live faithful to God today. We have to determine to be followers of Christ, not because we did it yesterday or we have grand expectations of what's going to happen tomorrow, but we've got to commit to be followers of Christ today. And sometimes I think what trips us up is we coast off of the greatness of yesterday, or we can't wait till things get better tomorrow. But man, if we don't live faithful today, there's no guarantee we're going to be faithful tomorrow. And just because we lived faithful yesterday doesn't mean we're going to be faithful today. You and I have to make this decision to be the people of God today. Today. And then if the Lord blesses us with tomorrow, guess what? We have to do it again tomorrow when tomorrow is called today. Let's look at Hebrews. Hebrews, towards the back of your Bible, chapter 3. <laughs> they went through the Red Sea. They saw ten plagues. Their firstborn children didn't die when everybody else in their neighborhoods did. Three days later. God, what's going on? Where's the water? Then they get their head screwed on straight. One month goes by, grumbling again. We have to determine to be God's people day by day. Day by day. I'm talking about today. 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 In Hebrews chapter 3, Starting in verse 12, take care, brethren. So much of Hebrews is a commentary on what happened in the Old Testament to the children of Israel. And it says in verse 12, take care, brethren, that there not be any one of you in an, an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Take care, brethren, that none of you have an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. How do we do this? 
We encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called what? Today. So that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceitful. It's tricky. It's subtle. You don't see it coming. Sin is not often dressed up like Darth Vader with the theme music as it walks into the room. I'm about, I might be greedy right now. That doesn't happen like that. It doesn't happen like that. It walks in like a little kid with a lollipop and braids. And hey, want to look at my lollipop? And you're like, oh, you're so cute. You're so cute. You lick that lollipop and it poisons you. That's how sin is to me. It's deceitful and subtle. And it changes what it looks like. The way that the adversary is going to get to you isn't the same as he did it yesterday as he's going to do it today. Amen? Sometimes you overcome a challenge yesterday, and there's a new challenge today. And if you're posting off like you're the man, you're the, you're the woman, because you overcame yesterday, you are right. You are right for the adversary today. That's why we're talking day by day. As long as it is called today, we set our minds and determine our hearts that we are going to be God's people today. I may not have been His man yesterday. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I do know today I'm living for the Lord. I'm living for the Lord today. 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 I can't figure out tomorrow. Yesterday I messed up. But today I got a new chance. I got a new opportunity. Today. That's why he says this. So as long as it's called today, verse 14, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the what? Until the end. So while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me. And that provocation is what we just read in Exodus chapter 16 about when they grumble. Right? And so the writer of Hebrews says, we will become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the faith until the end. But you know how we hold fast the faith and keep the faith until the end? We keep it today. We keep it today. It may be a daunting prospect for those of us in this room, whether we've been living for Christ for a long time or you're just interested now this morning. Faithful to the end of my life. Whew, I got a lot of life ahead of me. Or, I got a lot of troubles ahead of me. Or, I may not have much time ahead of me. And it's going to be different. But, man, I, can, I can keep the faith today. I can live for God today. Unto the end. Whew. But I can, I can keep the faith unto the end today. I know I can. You know how I know I can? Because it's 11.35 right now, and I have plans to keep it to the end of this hour. And then when 12 o'clock comes around and we're out there eating food, if y'all stay out of my way, I'm going to keep it to one o'clock. But that's how we do it. That's how we run this race. One step at a time. One mile at a time. One day at a time. That's how we do it. Day by day today. We keep the faith today. We don't close off on what happened yesterday. And we don't worry about tomorrow. Today. Today. Tell your neighbor, today. 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 The way, let's go to Matthew chapter 6. Today. I'm going to keep the faith today. I'm going to live for the Lord today. I'm going to obey Christ today. I'm going to follow Him today. Today. The way that we stay faithful for a lifetime is by staying faithful today. We can't coast off of yesterday's faith. We can't live for Him tomorrow. We only have today. Now listen to this. You can't live off of the failures of yesterday either. Some of us messed up yesterday. Some of us sinned yesterday. Some of us got angry with a loved one or a spouse 
in a very inappropriate and sinful way. Some of us were lazy yesterday. Some of us were apathetic yesterday. Some of us lied yesterday. Some of us did, did uh, evil thinking and were lustful yesterday. And guess what? That's over. That's gone. It's a new day. Are you going to let the mistakes of yesterday creep into today? No. It's a new day. You don't have to do that again today. you got a new chance today. Just like you can't coast off of the victories of faith that you had yesterday, we can't live in light of the sins of yesterday either. We have to start fresh today. You know, it says that His mercies are new every morning. When I think about that, I think that, God, every morning that I wake up, that you give me your grace and your mercy, that you give me another chance, He knows what I did yesterday. Don't you think He could take me out if He wanted to? He could. But He gives me a new chance every day, a new opportunity every day. And what I did yesterday or last year or last week or every moment of my life up until today is gone. I got today to do it right. I got today to be faithful. I got today to be loving. I got today to follow Christ. I got today to reach out to my neighbor. I have today to forgive. I have today to pray. I have today to seek Him in the Scriptures. We've got today. We've got today. Don't live off of the victories of yesterday. You may have parted the Red Sea for you yesterday, but today's a new day. There ain't water in your house. What are you going to do today? You've got to be faithful. You've got to love the Lord today. And you might have messed up today. Yesterday might have been the day you grumbled. Maybe, you, maybe you've been wandering from Him for some time. And you coming here this morning is a step of today being a new day. Well, praise the Lord. Praise God. And don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't be afraid of tomorrow. You've got today. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. For this reason, I don't want you to be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you put on. Because life is more than food and the body more than clothing, isn't it? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth? Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They don't toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. And so if God clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into his furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith? So don't worry then, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear for clothing? What will uh, my future be like? What will my relationships be like? I'm single and I'm, uh, I'm worried about my marriage. I'm married and I'm worried about my marriage. I've got kids. I don't know how I'm going to figure out their future. Things are expensive. The, the country we live in may change. There could be terrorism. There could be problems. There could be diagnoses in the future. How are we going to sort that out? He says, don't worry about that. You focus on today and trust me. Doesn't God take care of the creation around us? This grass ain't worried about whether or not it's going to turn green when spring comes. Because God's got it covered. And so all this ground needs to do is just lay low and let God take care of them. And that's what we need to do. We need to not be worried. And he says that. For the Gentiles, the people that don't know God, Eagerly seek these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. But instead, here's what we do. We seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all those things will be added to you. He doesn't say, hey, live for me, and I don't know how it's going to work out. He says, live for me, and I'm going to take care of those things you're worried about. I'm going to take care of your physical and material needs. I'm going to take care about your emotional needs. I'm going to take care about your hearts and your lives and your homes and your family. If you get busy, focus on me today, I'll take care of those things that you're worried about today and tomorrow. What a deal we have that God is making with us. He said, I'll take care of your future and your present. You just worry about me. Worry about me. And I'll take care of you. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And all those things will be added unto you. And He says, don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So, you want to be faithful until the end? Be faithful to the end of today. And then do it again tomorrow. 
step by step, He'll lead us, and we will follow Him all of our days. Just today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't live in the shadows of the mistakes of yesterday, nor in the victories of what God has done. That's dangerous. Live for God today. And so, my resolution for today is to do just that. I want to wake up every morning. I want to say, okay, God, today's the day I'm going to be faithful to you. Today's a new day, a new chance, so let's go. Well, this friend, today. Some of us have resolutions. We want to read through the Bible in a year. You know how you read through the Bible in a year? You read it for 15 minutes a day. Some of us want to have a deeper relationship with God through prayer. And so we have great goals and expectations. We're going to pray for an hour every day. Go for it. You know how you can pray for an hour every day? Pray for five minutes today. Some of us have a burden for our neighborhood. We want to preach the whole street. And it seems overwhelming. You know how you do that? Love your neighbor today. Love your neighbor today. I want to lose 50 pounds this year. You know how I do that? No, I don't actually. <laughs> but I do know that if I make choices today, that's step Those are steps in the right direction. What it takes, day by day, day by day. And then we do it again tomorrow. And then when enough today's past, we'll be the people God's calling us to be in the world. Amen? The beauty of this whole thing is that God, unlike us, have a eternity. God is faithful yesterday. God is faithful today. And God is already faithful tomorrow. He's got it covered. Our job is to just be faithful to Him today. Be faithful to Him today. Live holy today. So, with this new day, this new thing, I say you take Him up on His offer, amen? And live for today. And tomorrow, God gives us the gift of a new morning of His mercy. I'm prepared to do it again tomorrow. And the next day. But today is the day I'm going to live for God. Today is the day I'm going to live for God. Anybody with me on it? Today is the day. Amen. Let's stand and pray together. Father, we thank you for this new day. And Lord, we are grateful for the good things you've done in the past and the great hope we have in the future. But Lord, all we have is this moment here today. And so I pray that you would help each of us to be resolved to live for you today to the best we know how, to the best of our ability. We are weak and we have messed up all the days before now. Father, and, and we may be failing later today, Father, but for this moment and this chance right here, we want to be faithful unto you. Help us to not get overwhelmed with the future. Help us to not uh, deal with the shame of the past, but help us to live today. Help us to encourage each other that we've got to them, that we've got to them, we've got to them. Help us, Lord. Please help us to be your people today, to glorify you today, to be holy today, to be faithful today, to forgive today, to be compassionate today, to be obedient today, to serve you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, our mind, and strength today, today. Thank you.